um, let me begin by saying that Michael E. Sivaraman was a much loved, well known, well regarded, well respected activist uh, for people's rights in Tamil Nadu. Um, she was a full time worker of the Communist Party of India, Marxist, who had played a very important role in both trade union movements, worker struggles, and women's movements in the state of Tamil Nadu and nationally as well. Uh, Maithili led four decades, about 40 years, of a politically active life in public life from 1968 to about 2007, 2008. Um, in, the, in the course of these four decades, she consistently raised a powerful clear, cogent voice against capitalism, against patriarchy, and against caste oppression. Um, so I want to, this is just by way of a very brief introduction. I also want to add the rider that whatever I say today, whatever I end up saying, I cannot possibly do justice. I cannot compress or condense the range or the breadth of her work. Uh, for Maithili was an activist, an intellectual, a writer and thinker, and an organizer, a grassroots organizer. Such was the range of her work. Um, I want to also reflect on this moment that has brought us together. I see this truly as an extraordinary moment. Her, her passing has triggered a collective grief um, I have, what I mean by that, I have, for instance, personally received hundreds of messages from friends, from comrades, from those who have worked with her, who have known her, who have read her writings, um, many of whom, in fact, almost all of whom have told me that they see it as a personal loss. They feel her passing as pain, the way I feel her passing as pain. So I'm not the only one who is sleepless or haunted or feeling bereft at this moment, right? I recognize that this is a collective outpouring of grief and that makes it a truly extraordinary moment that I do want to reflect on for a minute here. There has also been I'm happy, very happy to note, a renewed interest in her work, her writings, her words, in her books, in her videos, in videos of her interviews, in her voice. Something I have been observing and friends have pointed out to me over the last few days is how Twitter constantly has this hashtag, Comrade Maithili, C-O-M, not the full comrade, C-O-M, Maithili, spelled at the end with an I for some reason, because she always spelled her name with a Y. Twitter also has Maithili Sivaraman uh, as another hashtag. Uh, so, but you know, this doesn't surprise me uh, because I always knew that Maithili was a blazing radiant star. Strangely though, she never quite knew it herself. Um, so having said that, I want to, uh, what in the course of this, the 40 minutes that I will take talking to you, what I will do is to introduce you to, so who was Maithili and how did she come to be who she became? Uh, what drew her, what, uh, what attracted her, what drew her to people's movements and activism? You know, all of us have a journey to find a meaning in our lives, right? What was her journey? And where did it take her? I want to also say this to you like a story, like a narrative. I want to show you the turning points uh, that made her who she became, right? Uh, so I think I will end up focusing really on her, on the first 10 to 15 years of her activist life. And I'm sure Comrade Suda will take us through many other important landmark moments and thoughts and influences of my day. Uh, so I think my focus will be from, say, perhaps 1968 to about 1978-80, during that period. Uh, 
I also think it's important because as young people in the SFI unit and other young people who may be listening to us, you're also looking for meaning, right? In life, you're looking for purpose. You're looking for a passion. So maybe something I say about my Philippe may strike a chord and inspire you in some way. And I will also say something about her personal life and her family life, because I can. I was witness to it being her daughter. Um, so let me begin by saying that Maithili came from a middle class Brahmin family. She was born in, into this family in uh, 1939. So that's about seven years before independence. Uh, and she was the last of five children. Her father was a, was a mechanical engineer in Chennai Corporation who rose in the ranks from being a workshop superintendent. He came from a lower middle class, quite a poor family, economically poor family. But because of his stable job, Sivaraman, so her, her last name, her surname is uh, Maithili Sivaraman. She, she, that's her father's name. As she told somebody when she got married who asked her, why don't you change your name? She said, because I see no reason to, right? So uh, Sivaraman, uh, therefore, he came from a lower middle class family. But because of his stable job in Chennai Corporation, he provided for his children well. Maithili's mother had only had six years in school, right? From, class, from the age of 10 to 16 years when she was withdrawn from school. So just about six years to be married off. She had to quit even before she could complete class nine. And Maithili's grandmother, so her mother's mother, her maternal grandmother, never went to school. Right? She had no schooling to speak of. But both women, both Maithili's mother and Maithili's grandmother, were voracious readers, so they were self-taught. They had a passionate desire for knowledge and to cultivate a life of the mind, something that is forbidden to women. That, that was forbidden to women from traditional Orthodox Brahmin families of that age, of that era in history. Um, as a young girl, Maithili reacted always to the social world around her. So something that was a characteristic of Maithili was to react always to the to so social circumstances around her. Poverty, the poverty that she saw, not in her family, like I said, but around her in society, impacted Maithili deeply as a child. It disturbed her. She had said in an interview, if she saw a woman begging with a child, she would be unable to bear it. It would make her both angry and immensely sad. If a classmate could not pay her fee in school, she would bring her home and force her own mother to fork out the money for her. Um, equally, Maithili as a young girl uh, did have questions about the status of women and girls in society. And that came and I think it does for many, many young women. So Maitri was perhaps not unusual in that respect from watching the division of labor in, your, in our own families, right? As one of five children with brothers, uh, uh, the kind of responsibilities that brothers had, that, uh, that brothers did not have, that sisters had, etc. Always made Maitri ask the question, why? Why is it a woman's job to do this, right? So interestingly then, Maithili sharpened her critique of conventional family life or of what passes for conjugality by observing her own family, right? So that's where it begins usually. Um, what Maithili learned when she observed her own family was that women could find married life empty and without meaning. She saw this from the example of her mother and her grandmother, where for both of them, marriage did not mean companionship. Uh, in fact, I must say that Maithili had in particular an unusual grandmother who did not care for family life or who could not find happiness in traditional, conventional, conjugal life. The life of home, of children, of family, the life that a woman was fated to have. Uh, Maithili writes in her book later about her grandmother, that she had a grandmother who liked the company of books more than she liked the company of her grandchildren. But therefore, Maithili's grandmother 
was regarded by those around her as somewhat unhinged, eccentric, and perhaps even somewhat slightly off. Uh, much later in life, Maithili, in fact, wrote a book about her grandmother's life, retrieving the life of a woman, a very ordinary woman, lived mostly in shadows and silences. I hope some of you have seen this book. Um, it's called Fragments of a Life, a Family Archive. This was published by the feminist publisher Zuban in the year 2005. And this book is the outcome of Maithili's quest after Maithili had become a feminist and a voice in the women's movement. Maithili researched uh, her, her own family archive and published this book. So this is um, just to give you a sense of that. So early in life then, Maithili was driven by a certain quest, one might say, a certain restlessness. What gives life meaning? No, the question that I think haunts all of us in some ways. But Maithili, I must say, was also academically brilliant. Um, so when she did her BA honors in political science in the Presidency College of Madras, she taught the university that year. She got the Candid Medal in 1959. The Candid Medal is given to students who top the university, Madras University, in political science, in the Department of Political Science. Uh, she gets the Candid Medal and the Gold Medal. Uh, and interestingly, this is 1959, 1960, when she insists that she will not be married. Right? She insists with her family, that is. She leaves for Delhi in the year 1960 uh, to the Indian Institute of Public Administration, IIPA, um, uh, to do a master's diploma in public administration. So that was quite a prestigious diploma program then. A lot of IAS officers, for instance, would also be trained by the IIPA, the Indian Institute of Public Administration. Now, we must see this as unusual for the times. Why do I say that? This is 1960. Maithili had an older sister who was six years older than Maithili, six and a half years, and who was married. Maithili's sister was married at the age of 19, uh, even before she could complete her BA. She then completed it the following year after her marriage. But for the younger girl in the family, and this is interesting because you see the divergence, the trajectory within a family in the space of a couple of years. Um, there is no marriage. Maithili completes her BA honors and she has the permission to leave for Delhi to get a master's diploma. Maithili's own personality, her own strong personality is also definitely part of the reason for this as she consistently tells her family, don't do to me what you did to Akka, Akka's older sister, meaning don't get me married now, etc. Um, I must study, I must be allowed to explore my own life. So in the IIPA, Maithili wins the Ashok Chanda Prize. Uh, this is once again a prize for academic excellence uh, and she returns to Madras in a year's time. Her dream is to leave to the US on a fellowship, on a scholarship to study. And she does this in 1963. Maithili goes to Syracuse University in New York State to do a master's program in public administration. Um, now, once again, I want to point out how unusual this is. The year is 1963. Here is Maithili, 23 years of age. She's unmarried, she's single. She's not married and going with a husband, right? She's going by herself alone as a single woman on a fellowship, right? Her fa to study. Her father only pays for the airfare. Right? The, the rest of it comes from the fellowship. Um, so we must bear in mind the historical period as well. Um, I remember Maithili telling me about the culture shock that she was exposed to because when she went to the US almost soon after, when she joined Syracuse University, she had to also work to supplement her scholarship. So what was the work she did? She was a warden in the girls' hostel in which she was staying. She was made a warden. So she would say what this meant was that she had to often break up young students, meaning the girls and their, who would be cuddling their boyfriends, right? Around curfew time. So there was a curfew time and there would be these young American couples, you know, necking, kissing, cuddling. 
and Maithili would have to sort of break them up uh, and say curfew, curfew, because she was the warden hostel and sent the girls into the hostel. And Maithili has obviously spoken about what initially the sort of the shock that this was to her system, right? Um, but more importantly, uh, what, what did America do to Maithili? It was the political climate of the US in the 1960s. Uh, there was the civil rights movement for equal citizenship for black citizens of America. Um, the struggle to desegregate schools, buses, libraries, hotels, all public places. Then later, the Vietnam War and America's intervention in Vietnam War, which was opposed uh, by student protests that broke out across campuses in the US. Now, these movements, then the anti-Vietnam war struggles and the civil rights movement exposed mightily to the truth of America, what America was to the rest of the world, right? That face she saw very vividly through the Vietnam War, through America's intervention in Vietnam, and what America did to its own disenfranchised black citizens, right? Um, so these years in the US politicized mightily importantly. She then, after her master's, she worked in the UN, uh, in the permanent mission of India to the United Nations. Now, what did she do there? She was part of the committee for decolonization, 66 to 68, 1966 to 68. Um, this was the period committee for decolonization. We must remember 1960s was the period when many African countries won their independence from colonial overlords, right? So Maithili would have to do a lot of background research and prepare statements on decolonization for Indian delegates to the UN to deliver. She would have to do that background uh, research um, and, also make some, and also make presentations herself in the UN as part of the permanent mission to the UN. So the influences on Maithili then, think of these years, think of the heavy years of activism, of student organizing or in the US in the 1960s. Maithili was hearing on the one hand the speeches of Martin Luther King and then a little later the speeches, the more militant speeches of Malcolm X, uh, the militant black leader. In fact, she has often told me that even before she returned to India or by the time she came back to India, it was Malcolm X uh, whose politics had become the more dominant vision within um, uh, black politics in the US. Uh, and of course, Martin Luther King's assassination was another uh, incident that shook up much of America then. Maithili had a group of friends with whom she discussed world politics, economic disparities, social justice, and racism. And of course, revolutionary movements in Latin America and the opposition to imperialism. Think of Che Guevara, right? Um, so how did Maithili then see America? Because of her experience in the United Nations, as part of the Committee for Decolonization, Maithili saw America as a bully country. Hence her anger, her deep-rooted anger against US imperialism. In fact, her older sister, more than once, has asked Maithili, why don't you just stay on in the US since you've studied there, you work there and earn there? And Maithili would always say, I have seen the US bully third world countries, arm twist third world countries, humiliate third world countries, even within the forums of the United Nations. The US is a bully country. Why should I stay there? So then Maithili then, it was, I suppose, almost inevitable then that Maithili should turn to Marxism and its vision of a new world order, not founded on exploitation, but offering instead the prospect of emancipation of all humanity, right? So that was really the context in which Maithili reads Marxism and turns to Marxism and embraces Marxism. Now, during this period, there is also something else that happens in Maithili's life. And this strengthens her commitment to the socialist cause. So what happens is this. In June 1968, Maithili makes a secret visit to Cuba. Okay? It's a, the revolution then, remember, is about the Cuban revolution is about a decade old. It's about 10 years old when Maithili goes to visit Cuba in, in uh, June 1968. Um, now, Cuba is obviously America's enemy country, right? So Maithili has to make it a stealthy visit. 
she goes to Mexico, and then from Mexico she goes to Cuba, and then back she returns to the U.S. via Mexico. So far as the U.S. is concerned, she has only gone to Mexico and back. That added leg of the journey from Mexico to Cuba is kept a secret from the U.S. immigration authorities. And the way it happens is that when she returns from Cuba to Mexico, she doesn't board up the usual flight because then it would be stamped on her passport, right? What they do, Cuban friends, is they put Maitali in a postal plane, a tiny plane which just carries post bags. Post, right? So Maitali, postal bags, and the pilot in a small postal plane fly back from Cuba to Mexico, and then Maitali proceeds back to the US. Uh, so in Cuba, she met, Maitri met a wide spectrum of people and spent nearly three weeks traveling the length and breadth of Cuba. Um, and something that, and she's written articles, she's written uh, several papers about what moved her about uh, Cuba, the Cuban revolution. Uh, one of those things is how everyone must engage in physical labor. Ministers, writers, artists, bureaucrats, whoever they may be, must engage in agricultural labor. This is also part of ramping up agricultural production in Cuba. But this is also, this was also a calculated strategy to break this hierarchy between mental labor and manual labor. And Maitili writes a piece in which he reflects on Cuba and Cuba's example in the context of the Gandhi centenary year of 1968. Gandhi centenary year of 1968, in which Maitri says, um, in which Maitri is reflecting on how manual labor in a caste society like India is so derogated. And look at the, the, the validation uh, of manual labor in socialist Cuba. So Maitri starts to write her pieces then in 1967, 68, and starts to publish them. So she returns to work in India for social change. She's not exactly clear where she would like to work, what she would like to do. Um, she had several options before her. One of them was the first JNU again. Interestingly, JNU is also a part of this story. Um, the first vice chancellor of JNU, G. Parthasarathy, who knew mightily well when she was in the US, sends her a very fond, affectionate letter inviting her to come to JNU and work in JNU, whatever it is you want to, to do. The doors of JNU are open to you, he writes in his letter to Maitali. So that's an offer she has to perhaps go to JNU and work there. Another offer is from the London School of Economics to do a PhD. So she gains entrance to the LSC to do a PhD, but she doesn't get fellowship that year, but she gets the entrance that year. So she has these options before her, uh, so, but she, and then she has this idea that she must work for social change and she returns to India. So turning points, just note these turning points. Uh, the first thing she does is to go to Bihar, to Bodh Gaya, where she meets the Gandhi and Vinoba Bhave. All of you know him, the land to the tiller through Gandhian uh, mode and spends a couple of weeks in with the Vinoba Bhave in the ashram. Uh, but that's not quite, that doesn't quite, appeal to her completely as a permanent resolution to India's challenges or India's problems. It is around this period that in December 1968, when Maitali is attending the wedding of her brother, she hears about the infamous massacre that took place in Kiravanmani village of Tanjavur district in Tamil Nadu when 44 agricultural laborers, Dalits, most of them women and children, were burnt alive inside a small hut, were charred to death. Maitali hears about it on the radio and decides that she must go there immediately. She's shocked, she's outraged. She decides she must go there immediately to understand what it is that has exactly happened. So within a week of the massacre, she reaches Kiravanmani. Uh, the Gandhian uh, activist, the very respected Gandhian activist, Krishna Jagannathan, accompanies Maitali on her first visit to Kiravanmani, less than a week after the massacre. And
And then Maithili begins to study and understand what happened, happened there and write about it. She writes in the mainstream, in the seminar, in the Times of India, in Pioneer, in the economic and political weekly. And Maithili attacks the, in, 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 in these pieces, Maithili attacks the free press for its outright bias. Because the press, the so-called free press, seems to project the Kirvanmani incident as two groups of Kisans fighting with each other and the landlord sort of receding into the background. Unfortunately, it's just Kisans fighting each other. There is no landlord really in the story. But Maithili is debunking this popular construction of Kirvanmani massacre in the free media, as she keeps sarcastically writing. Um, she also interviews landlords who are part of the Paddy Producers Association, which is opposed to the red flag union of the workers. Uh, and the landlords, as she captures in her writing, very clearly say, that fellow who folded his hands before us now carries a flag. He wants to plant his flag in, a public, in the public place in the village. So therefore, mightily, and they also say it's not so much the wage, and therefore mightily repeatedly makes this point that if we see, if we reduce Kirvan Mani massacre to a wage dispute, we don't understand what is at stake. Because what is at stake is the independent political assertion of landless labor, right? Their fight to march, bearing the red flag, to live without fear, and to reclaim a politics of dignity. So it is the autonomous political organization of caste oppressed, landless agricultural labor, which is at stake in Kiev and Mani. And we know this because of Maithili's many writings that explore the context, the stories, uh, that place Kiev and Mani and what happened. Uh, and Maithili also shows us that this is not an isolated episode. What she does through her popular pieces for the press is that she links Kiev and Mani and what happened there to the changing agrarian structure of Tanjavur district and to the changes wrought by the Green Revolution, right? So she also places it with respect to a political economic context, showing us what those links are. The title of one of her papers is a, one of her very powerfully written papers is called The Rumblings of Class Struggle in Tanjavur. And you can actually hear the rumblings of class struggle echo through her words when you read that piece, which I hope you will do. So then Maithili contacts, after the Kirvan Mani incident, she contacts the Agricultural Workers Union of the CPIM, who give her contacts, very valuable local contacts, to meet and interview in many villages in Tanjavur district. So she goes also to a number of other villages apart from Kirvan Mani, and many of these writings are once again captured in her articles in which she is trying to understand agrarian unrest boiling over into anger, right? Uh, and uh, this is a question that Maithili often asks in every village that she visits, where she meets with the Kisans who are revolting. Very often, they are unable to fly the red flag because of a climate of terror induced by the landlords, both political terror and economic tyranny because they are dependent on the landlords for their livelihoods. But Maithili keeps asking, when will the red flag fly again in this village? When will the red flag fly again, right? And, um, and one of their responses that she captures is, we cannot, from a Kisan, uh, we cannot do anything right now, but deep in our hearts, every one of us long to see the red flag in our street again. How can we let it go? Right, so my visual images of reading these pieces of Maithili are of this young woman uh, who was finding her way politically and doing it by going into territory that was entirely unknown to her uh, and seeking to make a connection, seeking to tell a story and seeking to build an alliance with those who were revolting, right? Um, so there's one more thing I also want to point out here. The biting anger, when you read Maithili, and I hope all of you will do this, um, uh, is the biting anger and sarcasm that comes through in Maithili's voice. She has a piece which is called Gentleman Killers of Kiel Renmani. Why does she write that? Because the Madras High Court, in one of its judgment, it acquits those 
who are held responsible, the, the landlords. So it, it doesn't convict them, it acquits them, right? It acquits them. And what it says is, we cannot believe that the landlords would have directly committed this crime. They are wealthy men with owning vast tracts of land who own cars, some of them, uh, to which mightily writes, well, honorable justices of the high court, you must know that gentlemen farmers can also be gentlemen killers. And that's why that piece is called uh, Gentlemen Killers of Kiliman Money. It is hailed, it was hailed then and continues to be as a classic in political writing. Um, but what is Maithili then, coming back to our story of the turning points in Maithili's life, so don't miss that. What does Maithili learn from her visit to Kiliman Money and the other villages in Tanjavur? That if the social change that she dreams of must happen, there must be a fundamental change in the underlying political structures and economic structures. There can be no social change without this underlying fundamental political and economic transformation. This is what has been, this was Maithili's important lesson. Um, she also meets VP Chintan, a visionary Marxist leader who draws Maithili into the CPIM. And Maithili, during this period then, uh, you must, uh, we must know that Maithili also becomes in 1969 the editor of a journal called the Radical Review. There's a group of left-minded left young people, and Ram of the Hindus, one of them, who, cut, who start to meet in, in Madras. I wasn't say Chennai now, the older word was Madras, who start to meet in Madras city, um, who are bound together by a common politics, by a shared vision, and they produce a journal called the Radical Review, and Maithili is the editor of the journal. Many of the pieces are authored by her. Um, so the Radical Review discusses, what does it discuss? It discusses left and student movements across the world. It writes about, uh, its pieces are about the concerns of both industrial workers and agricultural workers, uh, both in Tamil Nadu as well as in other parts of the world. It reports on anti-imperialist struggles in many parts of the world. And this journal is produced from 1969 to April 1973. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what, uh, of the kind of writing that Maithili did for this, one piece of hers is on the first BMK government, right? She's trying to understand the first BMK ministry government from a Marxist class perspective. She's asking, She's looking at what is its economic policy and she's unpacking it. What is its industrial policy? And she's looking at that. She's looking at the election manifestos of the first BMK government. And she's trying to show us very interestingly of how the BMK, once it is in power, is trying to remake itself as a law-abiding middle-class party. At the same time, it wants to project itself as a party of the common man. Uh, but it's really not a working-class party, as Maitri shows. Right. And she shows that by looking at how the BMK government handled and managed disputes between industrial workers and management that were then on the boil in Tamil Nadu. How repressive its own union could be of worker struggles. Right. So it's a very valuable then class um, analysis of the class characteristics of a new party with promise. Right. Um, that's one example for you. Another example is her writing, for instance, when she writes of the plantation industry in the Anumalai Hills of Coimbatore, she takes a wide sweeping view of the history of the industry from colonial times, of labor capital relations from colonial times, and traces it to the moment, the present moment, the present then being May 1972, to understand the dispute, or let's say the, the, the strike that breaks out. Um, Maithili's writing both in English and Tamil was powerful. She has a paper called Valparayin Virakkaviyam in Tamil. In English, that means the heroic saga of Valparay, the saga of the workers. That has also been hailed as a classic. Many now ask me, can, can I somehow find the copy of that? I'm sure I have it. I must look for it and I must give it to, the, to those who want to read it again uh, and to republish it. So remember, words can move one to action. Right. Um, so Maithili then had a command of those words that could move one to action. Um, 
I must also say that my police writings on caste during this period were absolutely important. Um, on the one hand was her writing of the Kirvanmani, the massacre, the agrarian unrest, etc., which is an explosion, an explosion, a caste class killing, right? An extreme violence in a caste class society. That was one kind of writing. But another kind of writing also interestingly that Maithili did was to look at the everyday life of normal caste society, of village life, right? What was the normal? What constituted the normal? And Maithili shows, for instance, the divisions, the, 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 the varieties of labor, of degraded menial labor that was expected of Dalits to perform. She shows how caste operates in everyday life under the veneer of the everyday, of normal. And she shows how you understand very little of rural life if you take away caste hierarchies, but you do not understand caste fully either if you do not see the structural denial of the right to own land, the right to ownership of land that comes through very powerfully in her writings. For instance, in a piece on Khartoum village, um, she produces a very moving petition written by landless Dalits, right, to the administration, making a claim for over 15 years for Porombok land or the village common land that has been denied to them. In these writings, she also captures the, the more militant rising and anger among younger Dalits in the village who are somewhat impatient with older modes of struggle and are... Um, eager and anxious to break out into newer modes of political organizing. So she captures those dynamics of society in change, of power and of the resistance to power. So and I think that's um, many of her writings are in this collection, Haunted by Fire. This was published by uh, the left word uh, in the year 2013 or 2014. If you can all see the cover clearly, I hope you can. This is my Philippe. Uh, this is her first visit to Kira and Mani. Uh, this was just a few days after the massacre of December 1968. Uh, and here is Krishnamal Jagannathan, the veteran Gandhian activist and leader who accompanied uh, Maithili and went with her on that first visit to Kira and Mani. The book is available, both these books, Fragments of a Life. Uh, if you would like to know more about her, uh, uh, both these books are available. You can buy them as e-books, etc. So when I read Maithili's collections and uh, uh, along with the historian and writer B. Gita, many of you may know her, um, uh, Gita and I had put together this collection of Maithili's writings in this book, uh, in Haunted by Fire. Something that struck both Gita and me was the painstaking research that had gone into these articles, into every one of them. And now being an academic, working in a university, uh, teaching students, I can just see uh, how much effort research requires and research of the very careful kind that Maithili undertook. What astonishes me is that when Maithili was carrying out this research, she was also simultaneously an organizer and a rising trade union leader within the CITU. Right. So she did not really have a university space from which, she, like I do now, no? any research I do is from a comfortable university space. I'm protected by that space. I have the resources of that space. But Maithili did not. Maithili was an organizer and activist who was simultaneously documenting and writing about the movements that she was participating in. And more importantly, that she was leading from the front. Okay. Um, so what do I mean by that? In the early 1970s, Madras City saw big labor strikes that shook up the city, many of them turning violent, okay? In company after company, like the MRF, Simpsons, Ashok Leyland, TBS, Metal Box, um, there were massive strikes, workers on the street protesting, working conditions, wages, etc. cetera. Maithili was often the president or the vice president of the CITU union of these companies, of the workers. Okay, so she was really leading from the front during the years that she was writing her massive pieces for all these journals, including the Radical Review. So I want us to keep that in mind. One of these struggles is noteworthy. 
the struggle of young women workers in a company called Tablets India, a pharma company. Okay, uh, Maithili has talked about this struggle very movingly in an interview uh, in which she says the daily wage used to be two rupees. Okay, we fought, that is Maithili and the CITU union fought for a 75 paisa increase to go from two rupees to two rupees 75 paisa. They won it, Maithili said, we won it, we made the workers permanent. All through the years of those struggles, they were all young girls. Most of the pharma company, the Tablets India employees were all female. It was a heavily feminized workforce. So they were all young girls in a Pavada Chokka. Pavada Chokka is a skirt and blouse, right? Wearing a skirt and blouse. Um, and Maitri said, through the struggle, the girls grew and so did I. Right? So Maitri also talks about coming of age through, the, through her participation in political movements. Um, another very important movement during this period was the struggle of quarry workers, workers in the stone quarries in a place called Pallavaram in Chennai. Uh, this was important, Maitri says once again in this interview, that those were the years of the emergency, emergency, when no strike was permitted anywhere, no one struck work, and yet quarry workers, the most oppressed of the oppressed struck work for 40 days, right? Um, I just want to add something. Last year, February 2020, before Corona, before lockdown in that other world we used to know and have, right? That period, I met the workers. There was a small commemorative function um, and uh, in honor of the workers of Pallavaram who had struck work during the emergency, I went to meet them and many of them were in their 70s and even their 80s, uh, Maithili's age, right? And all of them remembered Maithili. Not a single one of them, not a single one of the quarry workers of Pallavaram, whom I met last year, February 2020, had forgotten Maithili's name and they carried her memory enshrined in their hearts. And that was a very moving experience for me. Um, Maithili then went on to spend about 12 years from the early 1970s working very active with industrial trade unions. One important dimension of her work was that she was instrumental in encouraging, in, in, in strengthening what was called, what came to be called the Working Women's Coordination Committee. So what was this Working Women's Coordination Committee? So this is uh, the idea then was that women of all trade unions Okay, whatever trade union they belong to must come together as women because they share common problems in the workplace as women, right? So whether it was postal uh, department, railways, banks, insurance, etc., the Working Women's Coordination Committee became an important focal point, a platform uh, for uniting and mobilizing women workers in these companies around the most basic demands and rights as both workers and as women. And Maithili was, was, was really a household name among the Working Women's Coordination Committee during this period. Um, it was really towards the end of 1973, around September or so, that the Democratic Women's Association was set up in Tamil Nadu. Uh, what you now know as the AIDVA, All India Democratic Women's Association, was then, it was being set up in different states, right? So it was called the Jananayaga Madhar Sangam or the Democratic Women's Association when it was set up around September of 1973. And uh, along with doyans like K.P. Janaki Ammal and Papa Umanath for both fierce and well-known um, uh, uh, leading lights in the left movement in Tamil Nadu, Michael Lee was also one of the founding members of the Democratic Women's Association, right? Which as I said later then, becomes the All India Democratic Women's Association. Um, now, the thing about Maithili, interestingly, when I was growing up as a teenager, is that people would often be confused about my mother's identity. Like, some of them knew her as a writer because she consistently wrote in English and in Tamil. Uh, she would write in the Hindu, uh, in the Indian Express, in the mainstream, in Frontline, in the mainstream newspapers. She would write in a series of Tamil papers, magazines, periodicals. She was constantly chronicling whatever she was active in. Whichever movement, whichever issue she engaged in, she would chronicle it. She would write it because write about it. It's politics. It's, it's, it's con complexity, right? Uh, because that was 
her. She was both the writer, the thinker, and the activist always. No, uh, so many people did not know that she was a communist party full timer. They didn't know she had an identity as a communist leader. Many people would ask me, "So your mother is Maitri Sivaraman, the writer?" I would say, "Yeah, correct." And uh, many people knew her as a women's movement leader because then she went on to build the Aidba also in Tamil Nadu. Uh, uh, and uh, so they didn't know she was a trade union leader or she had been active with industrial unions, right? And that confusion, I think, was only natural. No one was to be blamed because Maitali was all of these things, right? She was the industrial organizer. She was a women's movement organizer and a leader. She was a writer. Many people thought she was a journalist. She was a public speaker. figure and the public speaker um so one thing i would like to say about her work with the aid bar then in the 1980s and the 1990s the all india democratic women's association was that maitri was instrumental in bringing together a coalition of women's organizations on the issue of violence against women so whenever there was an incident of violence against women Maitali would play a lead role along with the aid bar in bringing together a number of or other women's organizations many of them were in fact much far more middle class organizations many of them had a social work orientation they did not have a class mobilization orientation they had a social work orientation but what maitali did because of the force of her personality was to reach out to these organizations to the women's organizations and convince them persuade them work together with them convince them of the necessity to come to the streets of necessity you know there is even today this notion that if you were part of a more respectable organization of a more middle class organization you won't be protesting on the streets no right but what maitri did was to break that to a large degree by drawing women and organizations that were more middle class more social work in their orientation into street struggles as well by saying that this is an issue for which we need to march on the streets we need to gather in front of the collector's office district collector's office it is not enough to issue a statement it's not enough to hold a hall meeting hmm. and i remember Um, many years later i met through some other contact the member of an organization called monday charity club so women would come together largely brought together by charity work this is a quote this is a quote from her if we got an invite to a meeting or a protest from maitri we could never say no okay my internet is unstable it says i hope it is stable now okay i hope my internet is stable in case i go offline let me know So what did she say? She said, "If we got an invite from Maitri, we would never say no, right? Because uh, and see, this was important. I remember Bhamri Devi's rape, the rape and sexual assault of women of Vachati, tribal women of Vachati. Then Maitri's role in bringing together a number of other women's organization was instrumental, was pivotal. And see, Maitri then had the job of convincing the women that whoever is the wrongdoer, you must confront." it may not only be the husband of a woman it may be the state that is the wrong doer it may be the police that is the wrong doer it may be the forest department that is the perpetrator right whoever is the perpetrator meaning however powerful you must confront okay and i think she was able to do it through what i would call the force of her personality something that i would call soul force no when someone speaks to you with all their heart and you see that it is genuine right and you see the beauty of their soul you are moved to action because it brings out the best in you right so that's at least how i understand it to this day um another important dimension of maitri's leadership and activism during this period in the 1990s was what happened in madras city then was the rss began to organize these processions vinayaka chaturthi vinayaka chaturthi i think you understand what i mean vinayaka chaturthi processions um taking the vinayaka idol through specific deliberately through neighborhoods with a heavy muslim population like say the streets of tripoli k in order to foment communal unrest now we know this is rss strategy tried and tested in many parts of the country so when this began 
what maithili would do would be to leverage these existing contacts with these middle class other women's organizations draw them into opposing this and in fact something she has often said at meetings and i've heard her say it at home as well is it is absolutely important that all women's organizations must oppose the rss and communal politics especially those women who identify as hindus right so do not let your faith be hijacked if you identify as a believing hindu you must be outraged by what the rss is trying to do in your name and you must say no to this so this was also a very important dimension to maithili's leadership of the aidwa and women's organizations in the 1990s and i'm sure there is much much more but comrade sudha will lay that before you uh, but before i wind up here i do want to say a little bit about maithili's family who did she meet who did she marry um through the radical review she met karunakaran an engineer in a private working in a private company now who was this karunakaran my father clearly so karunakaran had gone to the uk he was trained as an engineer he had gone to the uk uh, he was sent by the company for a period of work and study right in the uk like maithili was in the us for a six year period between 1963 and 1968 karuna karan was in the uk for a 2 to 3 year period and in the uk he became a marxist right and uh, so see this is the interesting thing in the 60s and 70s when young people went to the uk and the us they were exposed to left politics and they became marxists so when now they go to the uk and the us i don't know what they become right maybe they don't come back so come back to india i mean but it was very interesting that karunakaran had this little bit of this trajectory where he also goes as a completely clueless young man uh, to the uk on a period of work come study gets exposed to left politics and becomes a marxist and then comes back to india he is still working with his private company uh, uh, but he wants to actively do something in social change and he's trying to reach out to the communist parties to the communist party cpi to the cpim but not very successfully because then it used to be quite difficult to establish contact and win the trust of communist parties right so but he was still making his moves uh, trying to sort of tentatively approach them um, be become a member could he contribute in one way or the other so this is happening in his life meanwhile his parents are trying to find him a suitable bride to get him married when one day he walks into a shop to buy i don't know something uh, bananas or something and he sees the radical review he just sees a copy of the radical review in a small shop so then he looks at the radical review he's stunned he doesn't know that a magazine and i the radical review it was the first issue that just started to come out Uh, remember this was the review that maithili uh, the, the the journal that maithili was editing so he sees the radical review he's amazed to find it and then he goes to the home he looks at the address he goes to the home of the editor and he meets his future wife so there's a movie on maithili that the historian uma chakravarti has made in which uma chakravarti i'm sure all of you know her um uma chakravarti asks karuna karan right my father she says so karuna karan how did you meet maithili uh, and he says well i went looking for her because he didn't go looking for her he went looking for the address of the editor of the radical review because he was so desperately he was so relieved that there was a group of young left thinking people in madras they did exist and maybe he could get in touch with them um so uh, they had they were married uh, they had an intercaste marriage um no ritual just an exchange of garlands uh, with a very very few uh, uh, invitees uh, with maithili in her trademark cotton saree and no jewelry um and before their marriage what they decided was that they would have this neat division of labor karunakaran would manage the family would have a job uh, maithili would be a full time political worker and an activist and that division of labor was something they respected for all their working and adult lives now i want to say one thing here i have seen many families on the left where both the husband and the wife are comrades right and both are often leaders in public life 
with both respecting each other but it is very rare to see a man who is in the back seat my father was never a public figure or a celebrity he always had some job in a private company okay so the man so i am now thinking talking of a situation where the man is in the back seat and the woman is the leader and he spends his life looking up to her adoring her and enabling her to be the blazing radiant star that she always was with no male ego to speak of i think that's pretty unusual okay in my view um my recollections of my home as a child growing up has been of my father welcoming young friends and comrades of my mother into our home often picking them up and dropping them off bus stay bus stand railway stations because people would be arriving and departing at all odd hours of the day and night for meetings for conferences so he was always called on to go and escort somebody pick up somebody drop somebody uh, which he would do um so i just want to end this therefore i've taken up a lot of time but i want to end this by on this personal note by saying what did it mean to me to have a feminist and communist mother i had a mother who was a feminist i had a mother who was a communist what did this mean it meant what were the images of my mother that i saw when i was growing up i saw her typing always my earliest recollection no as a child what as a baby what is the sound you hear what is the first association of your mother that you have right for me my earliest memory of my mother was my mother's typewriter she would always be typing and then there was no computer right so it would make that clickety clack clickety clack kind of sound no so it's the sight of the typewriter and the sound of the typewriter that i associate with my mother my image of my mother is who is a mother a mother is one who speaks at public meetings she writes books okay she's always reading the newspaper and she's cutting out she's got a pair of scissors in her hand she would never read the newspaper without that scissors she would always be cutting out extracts and filing them for her many speeches and talks right preparing meticulously always for meetings and talks um my idea of a family is one where comrades and friends drop in day and night i would often wake up in the morning sleepy go into the hall living room and find a young comrade sleeping who arrived sometime in the night maybe the middle of the night my idea of a mother is a woman who is in animated conversation who is the center of attraction surrounded by friends and comrades who are listening to to her even as she is debating with them right so those are my images of a mother that that is who a mother can be uh that's who my mother was um i also saw an equal democratic relationship between my father and my mother that was filled with mutual respect and affection and i must say that this has shaped me today as much as the books i read or the politics that was discussed around me when i was growing up now the last thing absolute last thing i want to say you know we've heard you all heard this phrase no the accident of birth what does it mean the accident of birth is you don't get to choose into which family you are born right it's an accident obviously no and often people use the accident of birth to speak of inherited privileges right so for example during the period of corona age of corona it is the accident of birth that determined that decided who was standing on balconies and banging thalis and clapping who could do that who was watching netflix within the comfort of their home that was accident of birth and who was walking miles and miles and dying of hunger and thirst the migrants that was also accident of birth it was the sheer accident of birth that determined these things didn't it right now the accident of birth for me has meant that i have had the great privilege the great blessing of being the daughter of being born the daughter of comrade maithili how this accident happened i can't explain but it has happened and i am immensely grateful for it mm, i haven't been able to say very much about maithili as a mother in case you are interested those of you listening to me uh, a piece i wrote a few years ago was carried by the news click okay so if you are interested you could look at the news click it's called my mother comrade maithili in which i explain this accident of birth and what it meant to me 
to a greater extent than I have been able to do today. I want to end this with a quotation which I shared on Facebook just about two days ago. Um, so here is the quotation. These are the lines by the writer Ursula K. Le Guin. And these lines struck me forcefully. Ursula Le Guin is writing about what is the revolution, okay? I read these lines for the first time several years ago. Now, here is where the quote begins. She writes on the revolution, you cannot take what you have not given and you must give yourself. You cannot take what you have not given and you must give yourself. You cannot buy the revolution. You cannot make the revolution. You can only be the revolution. You can only be the revolution. It is in your spirit or it is nowhere. Uh, these are powerful lines, no? Just listening to them in and of themselves. But later I realized that these lines spoke to me so powerfully because they reminded me of my mother. Maithili was the revolution, pure and simple. She embodied its finest and fiercest spirit. Long live Comrade Maithili. Thank you.